Sydney and Melbourne kicked off the 2024 AFL season with a somewhat slippery bang, if you will, considering the fumbles there were all night. But with the tumultuous 2023-24 off-season, the Ds were ready to get up to Sydney and get the job done. Evidently, their two-point trailing at three-quarter time got them to a 22-point loss after the Swans were absolutely fantastic in that last quarter. And with all the pressure that was expected to come, Melbourne needed one lucky break. And 24 hours later, it came with Brisbane choking a 46-point lead to the Carlton Footy Club just the next evening. However, as the footy world kind of moved on from that Melbourne loss, I just want to identify what's going wrong at Melbourne now on field because that is much easier to observe and look at than the off-field stuff. So is the concern real or is this just a round zero blip? Let's talk about it. So let's address the easier side of this coin, if you will, and that is the fact that it's just a first up game for a season. Let's not take it too seriously. There could also be some of you that are thinking, they trailed by two points at three quarter time on the road against a finals team from last year. Is it that big of a deal? And you know what? I don't really have a response to that because we're obviously going to talk about how big of a deal I think it is throughout the course of the video, but if that's how you feel, I'm not wanting to change your mind about that. I'm really not. If Melbourne go on and win the next, you know, 12 like Port Adelaide did last year, well, of course, any concern over Melbourne's form is going to look stupid. So that's fair. But there are some standout things here that just make you go, oh, shit. And they are the following. The first being the territory battle at the SCG, which, as you know, or if you watched from home, is the worst ground to watch football at. It's just not fun at all, but you live with it. And considering that my team, the Hawks, have had some really, really infamous wins at the SCG, and in my opinion, none better than round 22, I think it was, 2012, when the Hawks came back from six goals down, Brad Sewell kicking the seal up from a centre clearance. Amazing game. But this isn't about the Hawks. This is about the Ds. And again, for the first three quarters, yeah, the complaints you could make about both teams, the game itself, the style, were all justified. There were fumbles everywhere. No one was really looking clean. Bailey Fritch had an amazing third quarter. I loved the look of Blake Howes. Judd McVie was awesome as a guy that I think the rest of the footy world woke up and became a lot more aware of. Yes, Fritz was in open space, but that interception, which is what the handball was really coming out of the back half of the Swans and the kick to open space to Fritz was one of the cleanest possessions of the entire evening if you're a Melbourne fan. So everything was looking sort of okay. Well, what went wrong in the last quarter? Well, the Swans just turned it on. But let's get back to the territory battle because, yes, Sydney won the inside 50s considerably. But I want you to think of this stat. Meters gained. How much effectiveness are you getting from your possessions to take territory in a game of footy? Because as we know, with the amount of high half forwards that are getting up the ground and burning teams on the way back. Hello, Brent Daniels, if you're listening, with your four goals on the weekend for the Giants. Meters gained is something that you really don't want to lose a significant portion of. Now, sure, in a bad loss, the other team might get 200, 300 meters gained on you. Sydney, at the SCG, the shortest ground, won the meters gained stat by 749. Yep, 749. That is goal square to goal square four and a half times. What the hell? They were so slow. We can go through this arc by arc, and I'm tempted to do so, but they were so slow coming out of their back half, the Ds were, and with how fumbly and dewy the conditions were, they just played the ground wrong which wasn't great, and is something that is completely fixable, because they're not going to be playing at the SCG every week, of course. 
But that was a pulverization by the Sydney boys. But their back half of mine were just too slow at getting the ball out. And I don't think their high half forwards did anywhere near as good a job as the Swans were at getting up, helping, and getting back. Again, they, they did have, I think it was 19 scoring shots on the night from 51 entries, which is less than 33%, which is not great, let me tell you. But we'll cover more about the forwards a little bit later on. But that back arc of the ground for three quarters did a really good job. And, you know, conceding 86 points, I think it was, you know, it's not the biggest crime in the world, but... You know, it wasn't great. With ball in hand, their defense wasn't that great at all. I think a lot of credit has to go to Robbie Fox for the job that he did on Jake Lever. And I also want to give a lot of credit to Hayden McLean and Logan McDonald for the way that they played Stephen May as well. Look, was Stephen May amazing? No. Was Logan McDonald? Not really. Was Hayden McLean? I thought he was really good, but I'm not ready to say he was amazing in this game. But do them being good versus Stephen May being good Enough of a difference to be a net positive for the Swans? You bloody bet it is, which is awesome. The midfield, I'm going to talk about the ruck in a second, but Petrarca, Oliver, they got the footy. Uh, Petrarca did a couple of nice things. Oliver did a couple of nice things as well, especially in that first quarter. But as far as noticeable 30 disposal games go, when you're talking about Clayton Oliver, this wasn't one of them. We know the reasons why. Is that fixable? Yes. Simply put, yes, it is. So do I think he's going to improve on that? Absolutely, I do. So I've got no qualm there at all. Again, Petrarca, that's not going to be his best game for the year. It may or may not be his worst game for the year. We will find out. Christian Salem as a midfielder was pretty good. Jack Viney, that spot in my all-underrated team is looking more and more beautiful by the minute is Big Jack. But that's all right. We like that. But the midfield, I thought, were... You know, they were fine. Yeah, Heaney was awesome. Of course he was. No taking away from there. Golden was quiet, although his second half was considerably better, but he wasn't a Errol Golden game that we came that we became accustomed to, I should say, in 2023. So a bit of a tick to the midfield there. And we know Adams, no Parker, and no Mills. They should have got a bigger ascendancy than what they did, but they had no connection with their forward line at all. They really didn't have connection all around the ground, as you can see by some of these stats that the Swans just took the Demons apart in this one. Extraordinary the way that the Swans were able to wrestle momentum in this game. So does that mean the scoreboard flattered the Ds a little bit? I think so. But were there times where the Ds butchered the scoreboard? Yes. So 22 points, I'm happy to call that the medium between these two sides. But yeah, that forward line was grim. And what they couldn't do that Sydney did, and it's what took over in that second half, was they were able to mark the footy. And when you look at the forward line stats of the Melbourne side, it's pretty grim. And yes, Gorney's not a forward, I know, but as a guy who is targeted down the line by both opposition teams because they want to go to their ruckman, Sydney were kicking it long to Grundy and to Hayden McLean when he was going in there as the second ruck as well. To only take one mark, that's extraordinary. And of course, those other forwards there will be wanting to do a much better job at hanging on to the footy because even Bailey Fritch kicking four goals, one only taking a couple of marks is very low for him. But the big problem that Melbourne have got is Bailey Fritch, believe it or not. And it's not the problem that you're thinking. It's Bailey Fritch isn't the problem, but he is the problem. Let me explain. Bailey Fritch can be your leading goal kicker in a premiership team. I believe that. We know that to pretty much be true at this point. He cannot be your number one targeted forward. He can't be your best forward, but 23 games a year for 10 of them. Sure. Sure. But Van Royen and Shaki did not get the job done. And that was both there and the midfield connections fault. But where's Matt Jefferson? Why is Tom McDonald? An emergency. Why is Ben Brown not in this side? And if the answer is Melbourne fans, footy club, not that they're going to answer, but you know what I mean. If the answer is, is that they're not ready or not good enough, or they're injured, then you've got a problem. And the problem is, is that over the off season with everything bad that happened, you didn't address this problem at all. But you don't have a number one tall forward at the moment. Van Royen, 
could be a number two. Look, could he be a number one? Of course he can. Could this just be a bad game and he comes out and kicks six the next week and I look like a tool bag? Of course. Of course that can happen. It probably will now. Gamble responsibly. But if Melbourne are going to get six months down the line, they're going to need to have more forward options than hit and hope in a forward line that does not have the tools required or Bailey will get us out of jail. It's not going to work for them, simply put. So is the concern for Melbourne real? Yes. Is the fact that it's a round zero game mean everyone could be overreacting? Yes. Where do they go from here? Simply put, their actions on the footy field is going to go from there. Do I think Melbourne can still make the eight? Yes, I do. I don't think that game on the weekend is going to be Melbourne as what they are in a month's time. But it being the opening game of the year doesn't mean that you can't be concerned. Right? It was very clear with their 20 marks inside 50 that Praxim against uh, Carlton at Icon Park. Carlton didn't give a shit. We kind of knew that at the time. And boy, do we know it now, considering how Melbourne and Carlton played on the weekend. And Carlton were playing the better opponent too, just quietly. So yes, the concern is real. Is it fixable? Of bloody course it is. But Brody Grundy taught Max Gorn a lesson. And they need Tom Fullerton in this side maybe more than ever. The physical side and uh, teams going after Gorn, look, that could happen. Don't get me wrong. But I thought that the second ruck roll of the Swans was pretty important as well. Grundy was able to have his 20 disposals and get around the ground because he was fresh at certain points in this game. Gorn wasn't. And it's not that he can't last. Of course he can. Again, I don't think this is going to be Gorn's best game of the year. It could very well be his worst. And we just move on from there. But structurally, Melbourne look in trouble forward of the ball. And if you can't get the forward part of the game right, then you can win home and away games here and there. You can make the finals. But since the 2021 flag, they're 0-4 because they weren't able to fix the forward line. I'm a Hawthorne fan. We haven't been able to fix the forward line since 2015. We're 0-4 in finals since is what it is. But internally is where Melbourne have got to start. So where do you stand? Whether you're a Melbourne fan, not a Melbourne fan, is this a worry? Am I overreacting? Do you think people are ignoring this loss because of what Brisbane did on the weekend or maybe even how bad Richmond or good Gold Coast were or the way that the Giants were able to take apart the Pies even though they clearly wanted that game more than the Pies? Premiership medal versus round zero game. I know which one I would rather. So not that that's an excuse for the Pies. But it is what it is. But where do you stand on Melbourne? Were they in your eight before the year started? Have you changed anything about that now? Comment below. Let me know. I love interacting with you guys. The fight, the race towards 3,000 subscribers is still happening. And I need your help. So like the video if you like the video. It helps more people watch it. The more people watch it, the more they can subscribe. If you haven't already, click the subscribe button. It takes one second. It's a massive help. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed your weekend. We all get to watch our teams over the weekend as well. So I hope your team goes well, unless you barrack for Essendon, because up the Hawks. See you guys.